Start that. Did you start that, Daniel? I did not. Start what? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, but you just started the presentation, yeah, Rob. Started, uh, uh, Rob. How do you stop it? I think we'll have to go with it. It's already started. Yeah, which is no big problem. Hi, guys. Hey, Johnny. How you doing? I'm doing great, um, and I'm glad to see that we've got quite a few international uh, groups with us tonight. So, Dan, you have an intro that you want to run through? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me throw it over to you. Make sure that you're the well, presenter. We'll, go ahead and we'll just go ahead and get started, John, right on the uh, your title screen. So let's make sure you have the uh, power or the presenter. Sounds good. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 5, where we're going to talk about strength training with isokinetics. Um, John is going to take the majority of our lecture tonight, and I'm going to chime in here and there with a couple videos. See, Rob has joined us all the way from Prague, I believe. Yeah, how are you guys doing? Wow. Been in Prague doing well. Prague. How is Prague? Uh, Prague's nice, a little rainy, but uh, it's all nice. And hello and welcome to episode five of Isaac Kinetics 101. My name is Rob Potash with CSMI, the sponsor of this webinar. Isaac Kinetics 101 is a free webinar brought to you the third Thursday of each month. The goal of Isaac Kinetics 101 is to educate clinicians on how to use Isaac Kinetic machines in the clinic and the training room. Content providers and speakers are John Hisamoto of Proactive Physical Therapy, Tampa, Florida, and Daniel Bodkin in transition from Nashville to Atlanta. Uh, this episode, John and Daniel are going to discuss and demonstrate strength training and isokinetic exercise with a focus on eccentric loading and deceleration training. Um, so, Daniel, back to you, and thanks for being on. You're welcome. So again, you're going to see a lot of the science behind isokinetics with a big major focus on eccentric loading and deceleration training. And some of what you're going to see tonight as far as the science, John has covered in the very first uh, webinar we did on the science behind it because it's that important that we hit it again as this really is the bread and butter of the um, what we consider the, the, the mainstay of isokinetic training for a modern therapist. So with that, John, I'm going to go ahead and close down my uh, microphone and my... Uh... Well, don't do that yet, Daniel, okay. because I'd, I'd like you to introduce, make sure that everybody knows about liking us on Facebook. Yes. Uh, so you can find me at Daniel Bodkin, PT, DPT, ACC. You can find uh, Rob and CSMI as well at their CSMI uh, Facebook page. Uh, if you have emails that you want to address directly to us, I invite you to write them to Rob at rob.podash at csmisolutions.com. And if you just want to write to him, you know, ask him what his favorite, you know, recipe is for chicken parm, just, you know, flood his email just so he has to answer all those. Um, another thing I want to invite everybody to go to uh, cybextest.org. You can register your, uh, your clinic for isokinetic testing for free. It's a free database that we're building right now. So let's get your, uh, all your clinics loaded up there. I also want to give a quick shout out to uh, PT Inquest, to Eric Mara and J.W. Matheson. I've been listening to them for quite a while, and they're actually, you know, promoting our webinar series. So check them out if you haven't. And um, any of the intro music that we've been using for our uh, our uh, webinars that that comes from bensound.com. So I have to give uh, legally have to give a shout out to them for that. All right, John, are you ready, sir? I am going to try, Daniel, see if All I can right. keep up with you here just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so again, guys, thank you very much for uh, participating. We're glad to see that we've got a very large international grouping with us right now, and we're very excited about that. Um, I want to make sure that we're getting everything situated and working well so that you can see my screen and um, that everything is kind of working the way that we want it to. So having a little issue with advancement. So we'll get into that in just a second. As Daniel said, tonight is probably one of our more important ones uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, it's probably the biggest one that we're gonna get into when we talk about isokinetics 
and the things that we can do with isokinetics uh, when it comes to strengthening. So in the past, we've, we've talked about mobility. We've talked about stability. Right now, we really want to get into our ability to kind of look at um, how isokinetics can be used not only purely from a biological strengthening standpoint, but also from a neurologic standpoint. And so each one of those become important for us to make sure that we're moving through. So, uh, Daniel, are you still on? I am, John, and I'll go ahead Good. and uh, pull that up on my end. How about that? Sounds perfect. Okay. Oh, I got it. Okay. Here we go. So can you guys see my screen right now, discussion topics? Yes, that is on my end. So I'm going to go ahead and maximize okay. here. Oh, that's I'll you. I'll click through, John, as we go through, and you can discuss. Okay. So really, today's concepts, are, again, are strengthening concepts for isokinetics. is one of the most important ones. We're going to talk about eccentric versus concentric rehab concepts, and especially the science behind the exercise, because we need to, we need to be able to answer some questions in regards to things that we're going to be doing. So tonight, the major things that I want to – really bring forward is the eccentric loading deceler training, deceleration training programs that we utilize in our clinics in order to kind of help our patients get back to return to function and full go on the field trainings, everything that they need to be able to do. Again, in the future, we're going to come back and, and next month, Daniel's going to be covering the control modes of exercises, testing and training, and, and some of the case studies that we need to go. But Quickly, I need a disclaimer because it's important for us to kind of recognize that the information that Daniel and I are going to be sharing with you, we developed and it's owned by Proactive as part of our treatment programs for return to functional activities. We don't recommend that you utilize this information without understanding the background and progressions needed to make this program appropriate for your patients. So when we share with you some in high in intensity exercises. That doesn't mean that they're perfect for everyone. That's a patient that's been selectively trained to go through this program correctly. And we want to give you that information tonight of which ones that you're probably going to find to be the, the most beneficial. So again, we've always talked about the five basic phases. Mobility, talking about passive range of motion for range of motion. Stability, when we get into isometrics and tonight the big one's really going to be on strength it's the isokinetic component because there is not a better mode of exercise than isokinetics if you want to develop strength pure strength and we're going to talk about that tonight then we'll next month we'll talk about control we'll get into our timeline for function and we'll get into all of our testing parameters and things that we're going to be doing so let's go back to some myths and versus realities because this keeps coming back up and I hear this all the time and I hear you know do I need to do two speed tests are they necessary and I'm just going to come out and say that no two speed tests are not necessary if we really look at the force velocity curve which we'll take a look at in a little bit we kind of know what's going to happen when we do these tests and if you've done two speed tests in the in the past especially that usually means you're doing concentric concentric reciprocal one of the things you notice is that as the speeds increase the torque curves actually decreased or got smaller and that's exactly what we would expect in the force velocity curve so is it necessary for us to do two speed tests no what is necessary though is we should look at the parameters that we're using functionally on the field or for return to play, which means that if we're doing concentric contractions, we need to test and we need to train concentrically. And if we're doing eccentric contractions, we need to test and we need to train eccentrically. So, you know, what speeds have always been suggested? When I was a very young therapist, we started at 180 and we went up from there. You know, velocity spectrum training was the big thing. You want 180, 210, 240, 270, 300, and you want back it down, back down again. And if people were good with that, you went up and down again. It kind of reminds me of um, the gym called Curves. I, I think it's kind of bankrupt right now for a couple different reasons. But Curves was a gym really designed uh, primarily for women. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to eliminate that soreness, the delayed onset muscular soreness that you got. So they eliminated the eccentric motor contraction with the exercises, and they put you back into a concentric concentric with a pneumatic device. 
Well, while you while you're able to train a little bit from that standpoint, without doing eccentrics, you are losing more than 60% of what we do functionally. So, you know, we have to kind of pay attention to that. And speeds are going to be something that we're really going to be big on tonight. And, you know, I always, I, I kept hearing this. Do I need to do fast speeds for my fast twitch fibers? We talked about that in the beginning. I want to talk, touch on that one more time because science answers these questions. And I do want science to answer a lot of the questions that we're doing. And then finally, one of the best ones that I just keep hearing over and over again is what's better, open versus closed kinetic chain? So I'm going to be asking you guys some questions tonight also in regards to what we should be doing and what science has to say about each one of these. So, you know, I like to bring in some things, and this is from a really good friend of mine, Phil Page. Phil's a great researcher. This is from the International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy, and it's clinical commentary beyond statistical significance to clinical interpretation of rehab research literature. And really what it says is that evidence-based practice requires clinicians to stay current with scientific literature. The problem is not all rehab professionals you know, when we're, we're often faced with research that's difficult to interpret clinically. And clinical research data is often analyzed with traditional statistical probability, which may not give us enough information to make clinical decisions and appropriate decisions. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't use evidence-based practice. We need to, we need to look at what the scientific literature says. But we also, uh, tonight are gonna be presenting some levels on anecdotal information. And these are practices that we've actually developed through years of practice and consulting from an isokinetic standpoint so that we can answer one question that I keep getting over and over again. And I keep hearing this, that isokinetics is not functional. Well, what I'm gonna tell you is that isokinetics can be very functional if you know how to use it correctly. The problem is most people use it incorrectly. So let's go back to some of our basics. What's isokinetics? We already know it's constant speed accommodating resistance. So what does that really mean? We're supposed to stay at a constant speed and that the resistance accommodates through the range of motion that we're moving. So again, if you remember the quadriceps, it's an ascending, descending curve. Not all muscles are that way, but the quadriceps are, meaning that we're weakest at the endpoints in our range of motion, strongest at our midpoint in our range of motion, at around 60 degrees in the range of motion. And when resistance accommodates, it actually changes throughout the range of motion so that when we're weaker, we can we actually push with less resistance. As we get stronger, we can actually have more resistance. So it allows us to have maximum demand on the muscle throughout the entire range of motion so there's no sticking points. And again, the sticking point is that weakest part in the range of motion that you can lift a weight through. So, you know, if we're doing weight training, you can only lift where you are the weakest at. It doesn't accommodate to where you're going to get stronger. Isokinetics accommodates that resistance so that if you choose to resist maximally throughout the entire range of motion, you can. We don't always do that. We, we slowly increase demands, but that's the point that becomes so important. So again, if I talk quadriceps, I know it's an ascending, descending curve. My expectation is I'm going to be strongest at about 60 degrees in the range of motion. I'm going to be weakest at my two distal ends, 0, 120 degrees. But if I'm working at a high muscle capacity, I'm expecting the tension. And remember, again, tension is a signal for a hypertrophy to occur. I'm expecting my tension to stay high throughout the entire range of motion. Next month, when Daniel talks about isotonics, we're going to actually see an inverse relationship associated with isotonics versus isokinetics when we talk tension development through the range of motion. So getting back to rehab, because this is what's important to us. Our job as rehab professionals is to restore to a normal optimal state of health. And again, Dr. Allman was one of the first sports medicine specialists, really talked about rehab of the athlete, athlete deals primarily with the restoration of muscle function. And that is finding the missing quality of muscle function, identifying it and restoring it. So this is what I like to talk about tonight. What are the patient's weak links? What are you finding in your evaluation, treatment and training programs that you identify as weak links 
for a lot of our patients? And then how can we, as rehabilitation therapists, go about restoring that? Because if we identify those weak links and we develop a plan that allows us to restore that, there's nothing more functional for return to activity than getting patients to respond appropriately. So again, old history, early 70s, early concepts, really kind of set the basis, and it was all about high-speed velocity spectrum training. And I'm gonna tell you, I am not about high-speed velocity training. I am not about concentric, concentric, reciprocal. Uh, most of the research that's out there has been kind of based on this, but that's back when the, in the 90s, isokinetic exercise slowly started to change out when everybody started going to closed kinetic exercise. So here's my question to you, and because it, it should be interactive, and I want you to participate. So what mode of contraction do you concentrate in when you perform an open kinetic chain exercise? So let's talk quadriceps, because that's what we were mentioning just a little bit. So if you're on a machine, a, typically a leg extension machine, it's an open kinetic exercise. What mode of contraction do you concentrate in? And then I'm gonna ask you this. What mode of, of, con of contraction do you concentrate in when you're doing a closed kinetic chain? So just think of a squat, okay? If you can answer those, that may give us a little more information from a rehabilitation standpoint of what we should be doing with our patients. So my question is really gonna be, what's, what's more important? Is it that we were concentrating during that closed kinetic chain exercise on the eccentric motor contraction, and that happens to be what the deficit was with our training program? And if that's the case, can we do eccentric loading appropriately in both open and closed kinetic chain exercises? And the answer to that resoundingly is yes. We can't, because if we understand that what we're missing, our missing link is the eccentric motor contraction has a deficit, we need to improve upon that. And that's what we've tried to create by developing our eccentric loading deceleration training program. It's progressive sports specific training techniques that get us into full motion, stability, strengthening and control so that we can get this all the way through the range of motion. So going back to what science has to tell us, and Kerwin and Stanish had a great textbook on tendonitis, it's etiology and treatment. So think about tendonitis. How many tendonitis can you identify? Just start counting them off. Achilles tendonitis, patella tendonitis. You know, can you get hip tendonitis, shoulder tendonitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, you know, lateral epicondylitis? The maximal stresses placed upon a muscle tendon unit is during eccentric exercise. And only if one can strengthen the unit to withstand these stresses will it be able to cope and prevent injury. We can't treat a muscle tendon unit that's being injured eccentrically with a concentric contraction. They're not the same things. And we're going to talk about that over and over again. Dr. Hawkins, Richard Hawkins from the uh, Stebner Hawkins Clinic in Vail, you know, we, we we have shoulder and, and knee specialists. He really talks about, we've learned that eccentric control may be more important than constant control, and that scapular control is equally important to humeral head control, and we use that a lot in our shoulder program. And then a rotator cuff that is fatigue resistant to eccentric overload is best suited to maximize performance and lessen the chance of injury. So what we keep hearing over and over again is that eccentric motor contraction is one of the areas that we need to expand our treatment processes on, but we need to do it appropriately. So in, in our fir first course, when we talked about history, I also mentioned Tim Hewitt, who's out of the Mayo Clinic. Fantastic researcher, biomechanics specialist, runs a great biomechanics lab at the Mayo Clinic. And, and we talked about supporting the use of isokinetic testing in return to sports decision making. Well, I want to make sure that we just don't cherry pick, you know, a good line here and there for what they're really talking about. Because what Tim Hewitt really, really does mention uh, in this over and over again is that we have asymmetries. We have asymmetries in hip rotational control deficits, excessive frontal plane knee mechanics, postural control deficits, knee flexor and extensor deficits, and we need to be able to pick up all of those. Now, 
I certainly see that we start working on some of those frontal plane and aligning the knee a little bit more appropriately now than what we used to. I see us looking at hips, uh, rotational control so that we're maintaining neutral position and looking at postural. But if we don't test the knee extensors and flexors, how do we know if there's not a deficit? And do we put them back on the field with a deficit? And if we do, are we really looking for a secondary injury to occur? So each one of these become important. And I don't want to cherry pick and say, hey, testing is the most important part. Everything's important. We need to do open kinetic and close kinetic. We need to look at the joint above and below. So if we're talking about knees, look at that hip, look at that lower extremity and make sure that we've got everything going. And then check it out all the way up through that mechanism. Let's pay attention to what our researchers have to say and let's really pay attention to it. So again, you know, are we presented with a mobility or stability problem? So tonight we're really gonna be talking about stability or strength. That's the major issue that we want to address. As part of that, we know, and we talked about this before, that muscles only contract in one of three ways. You can do a concentric contraction, which is acceleration, and that's more of an accelerator or a motor response. You can do isometrics, that's function is stabilization, or you can do eccentric, and that function is deceleration. So when we often hear about research talking about deceleration, that's got to key us to understand that we're really talking about an eccentric motor contraction. So if we develop a really strong motor with really bad brakes, what's going to happen? We're going to crash and burn. And I see this all the time, especially with my pitchers, especially with some of my jumpers. They all want to train to jump high, but they don't land very well. They all want to throw 90 miles an hour, but they don't slow down their shoulder well enough. And then guess what happens? We have an injury. So if we talk about concentric, eccentric contractions, they are not the same things. So do your own research. Look into the differences between concentric, isometric, and eccentric. It's it's staggering how much of a difference. And I hear this all the time. Well, we just need to do exercise. And if they if they are doing concentric, they think that's good enough. And it's not. So we know that eccentric contractions demonstrate two to three times less EMG activity compared to that of a concentric contraction. Pretty efficient. It uses less oxygen. But it also results in much greater amounts of reported delayed onset muscular soreness, DOMS. So we know that we're really developing significant amount of tension in those myofibrils. And that tension is the signal for hypertrophy to occur. We also know neuromuscular control for eccentric contractions vary from that of concentric contractions. So again, there's not only a biological difference, but there's a neurologic difference associated with what we do with eccentric contractions. And I often get into this when I talk about testing, because if we see weakness both concentrically and eccentrically, you should think that they have biological weakness, They're, they have atrophy. But what if we only see them having a deficit in the eccentric mode? There's concentric contractions seem to be equal on both sides. Well, if I know that they have an eccentric deficit, I'm looking at a neural developmental aspect. There's something going on from a neuromuscular control environment that we have to adjust. And the advantage of that is once we understand it, we can, we can change that fairly quickly. So again, we talked about strengthening before. I'm not going to overbore you with all of those. If you want to go back to our, our first course and go through each one of these components, I would welcome you to do that. But there's a, there's a couple of things that we really need to talk about because this is what science tells us. And it's important for us to be able to address this right now because I keep getting this. When we talk slow twitch versus fast twitch fibers, how do we recruit? Everybody thinks we selectively recruit fast twitch fibers and we do not. Fiber recruitment is, is progressive from fast twitch, from I'm sorry, from slow twitch fibers to fast twitch A, the fast twitch AB to fast twitch B as our units of force increase. So as we develop more force, more tension, we need to bring in our fast twitch fibers. And we're going to see in just a moment when the force velocity curve, which mode actually increases tension development or force production 
faster and it's not going to be concentric. In fact, our testing in the past for the last 30 years basically showed us that as our speeds increase concentrically, what happened to our force production? It went down. So if we're, we're developing less force, we don't need our higher end fast twitch fibers to kick in. And that's going to reduce the amount of hypertrophy that we get. So again, strength is a result of cellular hypertrophy. We know it takes six to eight weeks of training to occur. But we also know in that first two to four weeks, we do get stronger, even though we don't have a biological adaptation to the muscle for cellular hypertrophy. So what is it that really occurs in that first two to four weeks that allows us to feel a little bit stronger when we first start in the gym program or training program? And that's that neural adaptation that we've talked about in the past. And again, when we talk about strengthening, it should be specific, okay? And so I love the said principle. <laughs> specific adaptations to impose demands. And what that really says to us is that our training program must match the demands of the activity. You know, if I have somebody who's gonna be hiking for 20 miles a day backpacking, I don't want them to do 10 maximum contractions because that's not going to be specific to what they're doing. But if I have an offensive lineman that's job is to stop a charging defensive lineman for five to seven seconds, then I wanna make sure that we're training him at, at, a, at a much higher intensity overall so that we adapt what he's going to go back to in his activity. And in doing so, we understand the overload principle of just being able to manipulate resistance, repetitions, rates, of loading and duration or time. So, you know, what's the difference between a running back and a marathon runner? And we covered this in the very beginning. It's the adaptations that we go through. It's the type of training specifically that we go through. We know marathon runners are runners. You know, they're running for long periods of time. They really want to have that slow twitch preferential uh, that they're going to be doing. You know, while they're running and our running back is running all so, but they're running at a much faster pace. Our typical running back might be 240 pounds now. Our typical marathon runner is 120 pounds. So there's a lot of different adaptations that go on in response to that. And it's very specific to how we train. And that comes back to our training program of our patients. If I'm going to take a basketball player and get them ready for a, a very high level deceleration over and over again, I can't do it three, five, seven, ten times. I need to do it over and over again because I know how long they're going to be playing and how many times they're going to be jumping and decelerating quickly. So we have to look at, are we doing single maximal contractions, such as what a weightlifter may do? You know, are we talking about running a football, you know, hard for the next three to five seconds or 100 meters at 10 seconds or 800 meters, which is going to take a couple of minutes. Going all the way on to it, you know, triathlons or marathons. Shout out to one of my buddies, uh, David Jacobs, who just completed his uh, 18th Boston Marathon. Uh, phenomenal job on, on his part. So we're really talking about repetitive submaximal contractions over and over again that he had to be able to put together. And again, neural control is important. I'm not going to get heavily into it. Go back and look at, at, at the first one to kind of adapt that. But here's what we have to say about neural adaptation. You have to train in the eccentric phase in order for adaptation to occur. If you're not doing eccentrics, you're not going to get that ability to decelerate the way that you need to. And one of the points being is that do we decelerate? And this is a question to you. I want you to answer back. In most sports, do we decelerate slowly through the full range of motion equally, or do we decelerate very quickly when we hit the ground or we release the ball? Does, does the muscle decelerate very quickly down to barely anything? And we pretty much all know it's a very sudden deceleration. It's a high-speed deceleration. And if that's what we're returning to, we need to functionally be able to train someone for that adaptation. So what are we really saying? We know that there's other aspects besides just biological. There's the neurologic component that plays an important role. And what I like about 
Phil Page is he often talks about Dr. Yonda, who's a, a, a Czech neurologist. And Dr. Yonda doesn't talk about the neural system or the, or the muscular skeletal system. He talks about the sensory motor system because it's so important that they interreact. And if we want to do a plyometric or a stretch shortening cycle like Comey has always talked about, we need to be able to, to perform the eccentric contraction in order to do the concentric contraction, which increases force potentiation concentrically. If we, if we use this correctly, we're able to actually generate more force concentrically or in our acceleration phase. And those become important to us across the board. So all of those concepts are important, but tonight it's really about the speed because I think if there's one area in isokinetics that has probably been miscued for a long period of time, it's really understanding velocity of movement, speed of contraction, and, and part of what we're gonna be looking at. So I can tell you hands down that velocity of contractions is one of the factors, not, not the only one, just one of the factors responsible for tension development. And tension is without a doubt the signal for hypertrophy to take place. If we don't develop tension, we don't develop hypertrophy. If we want to develop our fast twitch fibers, we need to be able to train at higher levels of force. So that's where the force velocity curve really comes in. And it's important for us to understand the science behind the exercise. And the force velocity curve has always said, maximal force a muscle can generate decreases concentrically or increase eccentrically as a function of increasing velocity. So the faster we go concentrically, the, the less force we develop. The faster we go eccentrically, the more force we develop. So there's an inverse relationship between concentric contractions and eccentric contractions with speed. So if we're going at faster speeds or what we call fast speeds, and what speeds really are those? Well, we'll talk about that. One of the things we recognize again is the faster we went and our testing in the past when we did concentric at two speeds, every time we did a faster speed, our peak torques decreased. So what happens on that other side of the curve where quite honestly, the high majority of our injuries occur? We need to understand that eccentric motor contraction and what we're gonna be doing with that in our training program. So this is going to be probably the highlight of tonight. If there's one thing that you take away from this, this is what I hope you're able to understand and start to utilize in your clinics in order to be appropriate. And this is one of our proactive pearls. We're going to talk about speed selection. So how do you pick speed of exercise? Do you have a method? Because we should. You know, we shouldn't just randomly say, oh, we're going to pick 180 degrees or 300 degrees or I want to go 450 or I want to go 30 degrees. So, and I'm giving you this information tonight. Uh, I haven't written everything down because I want to kind of talk through this a little bit with you. And what I say is more appropriate, and I'll give you some of the science backgrounds behind this, is that it's one degree per degree range of motion is appropriate for a neurologically intact, normal musculoskeletal individual. So what I'm saying is someone is a normal individual, taking them at 60 degrees in the range of motion for 60 degrees per second is something that they can handle pretty comfortably. And it's a comfortable speed for them, okay? So, so this is what I used to hear. Oh, go 180 degrees. Well, okay, my knee's going 80 degrees in in the range of motion. My shoulder's going 150 degrees in the range of motion, but my wrist is only going 30 degrees in the range of motion. Are those speeds appropriate for each one of those ranges of motion that we're going through? Am I, am I able to capitalize on any type of training specific for that? So if we do one degree per degree range of motion, it's going to be a comfortable speed 
for most people who are neurologically intact. I'm not talking post-surgical. I'm not talking about someone who has a neuropathy or another issue or inhibition. I'm talking about someone who, who's fairly normal that we want to maybe test and we want to be able to get into our training program more effectively. So how do we pick that speed? So again, one degree per degree of range of motion. So for 60 degrees, I want to go 60 degrees per second. So if I have 60 degrees in a range of motion for my knee, I want to go at 60 degrees per second as a comfortable speed for someone who's normal. So then what determines fast versus slow speeds? Well, the neurologic system and the musculoskeletal system does. You know, it's not, it shouldn't be a random number that we kind of throw out there. So what we really talk about from our standpoint is if you want to do a slow speed, you're going to go at a half of that or less. So if you're going through 60 degree range of motion, we're going to go 30 degrees per second or less. So here's my point. If we go back to 60 degrees of range of motion for 60 degrees per second, how long does it take you to go from point A to point B? It's going to take you one second. And then from point B back to point A, it's going to take you one second. Okay, so you're going to complete that entire movement. Now, if we go slow speed, and I say 30 degrees, how long is it going to take you to go through a 60 degree range of motion at 30 degrees per second? It's going to take you two seconds to go from point A to point B, and two seconds back. You're going half speed. What if we go at 20 degrees per second? Well, then it's three degrees, right? Three degrees from point A to point B and back again. How about 10 degrees per second? It's going to be six degrees, six seconds to go all the way through that range of motion. Why would we want to use a slow speed? When we've just talked about that high speed eccentrically increases force. Well, we don't always want to increase force early on in our rehabilitation program, right? We want to get mobility. We want to get stability. And we want to get through that neural adaptation for resistive training so that we can train them to be able to do an exercise appropriately. By slowing down the speed eccentrically, we allow them to stay in that eccentric mode for a longer period of time and complete that neural processing, that motor learning, that's so important for them to understand how to be able to decelerate eccentrically. So we go into a lot of slow speed training in the early phases of rehab, when we kind of pay attention to someone having suboptimal strengthening and or inhibition or neurologic problem, neurologic adaptation problems. As we see that they're starting to adapt, we go to more moderate speeds. And moderate speeds for us are going to be one half to two times that range of motion per second. So if we're, again, talking about a 60-degree range of motion, anything between 30 degrees to 120 degrees is going to be a fairly moderate speed. So going 120 degrees, we're going to be able to do that range of motion in a half a second. You're picking up the pace a little bit, and they're going to feel that, and they're going to see that, especially when it comes down to changing from a concentric to an eccentric motor contraction. They're going to feel that, and they're going to load significantly higher eccentrically if you haven't trained them to adapt to that program. And then finally, from a biological standpoint for strengthening, if we want to get to the best strengthening program, we want to increase our speeds eccentrically for adaptation at a much higher force production. What's the signal for hypertrophy? It's tension. And with higher speed eccentric, force velocity curve tells us we're gonna increase the amount of force or tension generated within that myofibrils. So again, if we're talking 60 degree range of motion, when we start going 120, we're at two seconds. What happens when we go 180? We're at a third of a second. How about 240? We're at a quarter of a second. You know, do we go faster than that? With very select patients, we may. But when we start going down to quarter second decelerations, we're talking about someone that we've been training on this technique for a long period of time, and that we're really trying to get them back to a very high level of physical activity, much like they're gonna find on the field when they're running that 100 meters in 
in 10 seconds. When they're able to pitch at 90, degree, 90 miles an hour, you know, so we need to be able to adapt our patients back to what they're going to be performing on the field and be able to train the muscle to perform correctly. So that's where I get into what's called a distance speed time formula. It's an easy way for us to kind of figure out, you know, if I want to go through a 60 degree range of motion, if I'm looking at the speed that I'm moving through, how much time am I going through? So distance would be divided by speed would equal time. If I'm looking for time, it would be distance divided by speed. If I'm looking for speed, it would be distance divided by time. And if I'm looking for distance, it's speed times tie time would equal distance. So again, distance over time would equal speed. So what are we looking at from a physics standpoint? If we're looking at speed, it's distance over time. If we're looking at time, it's distance over speed. And if we're looking at distance, it's time, time, time speed. Now, the problem is, is that we never brought in that range of motion as a consideration when we started talking about high speed exercise. We just did 180 degrees. It didn't matter. 180 degrees, 210, 240, 270, 300. It didn't matter if we were going through a, a 60 degree range of motion, 120 degree range of motion, or 30 degree range of motion. All we said was we just kind of threw it out there from a speed standpoint. But our range of motion has to be one of the parameters that we pay attention to to determine appropriate speeds for exercise and return to function. If we want isokinetics to be functional, we need to understand the science behind it and how we can apply it. So we have a time, a speed time distance formula that we can utilize, and that's going to give us practical, really functional applications for isokinetics in the 21st century. And that's what we're after, the proactive approach. I'm going to give a little kudos out to Daniel because I'm going to tell you that I don't think there is a a better young therapist in the United States, and I'm really going to say the world, who understands these concepts and can apply them better than Daniel. So if you're looking for someone from a training standpoint, he's the person you really should contact because he really understands this very, very well. So here's our first point. We call it two different things. So if you come to our clinics and you talk about uh, what we're going to be doing when we say eccentric loading, Eccentric loading to us means that we're, we're going to remain in the eccentric mode of contraction longer than the concentric mode. And typically, we're going to have a two-to-one ratio, eccentric to concentric timing, meaning that for every 20 degrees that we go concentrically, we're going to go 10 degrees eccentrically. And it's always going to be fairly slow. So if we're talking about a 60-degree range of motion, we're not going to be really getting much past 60 degrees. We're going to be talking about 20 degrees concentrically, 10 degrees eccentrically. The first number for us always represents the concentric speed. So knowing that if we say eccentric loading in our protocols that we develop, then we know that the eccentric speed will be half of that number. So if we write eccentric loading 30, 40, 50, that tells us we're going to be doing three training programs with a specific rest period in between, typically 10 repetitions. And our first exercise is going to go 30 degrees concentrically, but what back eccentrically? Correct, 15. We're going to go 15. So on our next set, if they do that well, and it seems like it's appropriate, and they're not having any problems, we're going up in speed. What would happen if you see that they're having deficits? They're starting to have inhibition and problems like that slow it down. Maybe this is even too fast for them. Let's go down to a 10 and 5. Let's go down to a, you know, a 20 and 10. Let's see what they can do when we really slow that eccentric loading down and see how they can adapt to, they can adapt to that before we go forward. So again, if we do eccentric loading 30, 40, 50, 30 degrees concentrically, 15 eccentric, second sets, 40 degrees concentric, 20 degrees eccentric, and finally, third set, 50 degrees concentric, 25%. Now, did you notice that there was something interesting about that relationship? 
if we went from 30, 15 to 40, 20, our concentric number increased by 10, but our eccentric number only increased by five. So we're kind of maintaining that same program all the way through. And if we go from 40 to 50, we go up 10 degrees concentrically, but only five degrees eccentrically to be able to maintain that half speed. And that's what becomes very important for us to understand if we're gonna do eccentric loading in the future, that first number is going to represent the concentric speed. Second number is going to represent the eccentric speed, which is going to be half of the concentric speed. So 30 means that eccentrically I'm going to work at 15 degrees. What happens then when we want to get into deceleration training? So we've kind of gone through all of our training programs eccentrically, and we've kind of worked up to we're going through our 60 degrees for 60 degree range of motion and we're starting to pick up the speeds a little bit and they're performing well they're strengthening they've gone through 50 percent of effort to 75 percent and we can start to move them we want to get them into a little bit of deceleration training and we want to do it when it's appropriate so when we talk about deceleration training we're going to increase the speed of the eccentric movement to increase the eccentric force production and again normally is one to two ratio eccentric concentric so for every 20 degrees that we're going 20 degrees per second concentrically we're going to move 40 degrees eccentrically so it's twice as fast coming back so we want to make sure that they've gone through those neurologic adaptations and that they're moving correctly through the sequence so when we talk about eccentrics we're really talking about the first number represents the concentric speed again but when we say deceleration 30 40 50 we know that that eccentric is going to be 60 degrees at 40 it's going to be 80 and at, at 50 it's going to be 100 and again notice that while the numbers increase by 10 for the concentric speeds just like it did when we talk to eccentric, it doubles when we talk eccentric. So we're really starting to give them a faster motor contraction eccentrically with our training program. And we take some of our patients fairly aggressively through this. So it really kind of depends. I'm not going to venture that I want you to take anyone into a 200, 220, 240 deceleration training without training them all the way through each one of these aspects because it's not good to put somebody under high levels of force if they haven't been trained for it. It's just like taking someone who's never been trained and telling them to jump off a five foot ledge. They're, they haven't adapted to that type of force and deceleration. But as we keep training them, we know that we're gonna get to that point. So let's just kind of take a quick look. We've been using these. Let's take a quick look at what eccentric loading 20, 30, 40. So this is one of our, our, our big basketball players. And when I say big is, I mean, he's a pretty massive guy, quite honestly. And he had a, he had a, a knee injury. So we started him very slowly and just kind of pay attention that as we go up through a 60 degree range of motion, we're taking it fairly slowly on the way down. It's twice as slow on the way down. So if we're going three seconds up, it takes us six seconds to come all the way back. What are we expecting him to do? We're expecting him to be able to load in the eccentric motor contraction at a level that we are asking him to give us maybe 25% of his effort. And we want to see that he's consistent with loading at 25%. So then we can go to 25 to 50% and see that he's loading that correctly. When he's doing that, then we can slowly start to increase our speeds. Now, is this functional for return to sports? Of course not. What it is, it's functional for, for patients that have neurologic deficits early on in the rehabilitation program, especially appropriate post-surgical. Uh, if they've had an injury and they've had uh, really a lot of inhibition, we need to kind of pay attention to. So, you know, what's our progression that we're going to kind of work them through? Well, we take them through a shoulder eccentric loading program. So again, you, you heard about this during our, our mobility program. So we kind of take them up where they just kind of ride through the range of motion and we let them just slowly follow the weight all the way back down so that they're comfortable. 
once we have them doing that, so we know that they can load, we want to take them through a slow eccentric. Notice where his hand is positioned. So he's following it up concentrically. He's giving us a very gentle pressure upward during the eccentric mode of contraction for his posterior rotator cuff. And then finally, when we have them significantly trained, and we're talking weeks into this program, we want to get into deceleration training so we can get them to that next level. So we increase the speed in the eccentric mode faster than the concentric mode. And again, this is something that I want you to really kind of go over. So again, here's one of our professional pitchers. And we're taking them through a rotator cuff deceleration program. So 60 degree range of motion at 60 degrees concentrically, 120 degrees, it's a half a second. Now, with this guy individually, imagine if I took him up to 240, which I have done, at a quarter of a second, it's half that speed. So again, if we look at him perform this, it's one, to, it's one up a half a second on the way down. Now, imagine he's coming down twice as fast at 240 degrees. It's a very high-speed deceleration. But what happens when a pitcher releases the ball? Everything in his posterior rotator cuff kicks in to decelerate instantaneously, and he has to be able to perform that. So my question to us always comes down to, are we teaching exercises correctly? So my point is, are we teaching patients that way? So I'm going to invite Daniel to come back in and unmute, because Daniel's put together some, some great programs, and I love some of the things that he's been able to kind of share with us across the board. Hello, John. I'm back. So what I want to play for you is a uh, side-by-side -side progression of our eccentric loading speeds. Uh, we're going to use the knee uh, as our example here. So initially, uh, what John alluded to was our eccentric unloading. So the machine is performing the concentric for her. Once she gets to the top of the motion, she's going to lift off of the pad, uh, that bottom strap. But now she's not pushing into the adapter arm. She's just following that speed down. So she's just essentially unloading those internal forces of her knee, the weight of the tibia, without any external load. And this is where we're going to start our patients off initially with eccentric loading. Now, with our ACL patients, with some of them, you can start this as early as two to three weeks post-op, um, especially if they had a hamstring uh, graft or the semitononosis graft. You can start them earlier. Now, if they had the um, patellar tendon autograft, you might want to wait until week four, depending on their level of comfort for this. But this is a very, uh, very comfortable uh, level of exercise for them at this point. It also is really good for helping them to get that um, full uh, extension. And you can see, look at look at that that tibia and how well she's able to control that coming down. So you can just see the level of neuromuscular control required for this. All right, so now we've progressed and uh, she's loading five degrees per second eccentrically. She's still going to ride the machine on the way up. She's not going to do any concentric action with this. You can see that we have that adapter arm placed proximally on the tibia. That way we can offload or offset any of that anterior shearing that may occur. It's still very light. We're talking less than five foot pounds of torque. So next, our athlete here, the, the eccentric exercising speed is 10 degrees per second, and the resting concentric speed, like John said, is double that, 20 degrees per second. So when he uh, names these protocols, he's naming it for that concentric 20 degree per second. So next, she's eccentrically contracting at 15 degrees per second and resting at 30 degrees per second. So you can see that we're moving our way along. And this isn't, you know, within one session. This is, uh, you know, uh, visit to visit, week to week that we're progressing these speeds. And it's based on the athlete. When they can produce these torques pain-free, 
they're not having any excessive eccentric inhibition, which we'll look at in the next video, um, that's when we're progressing them. So now we're getting even faster here. And you can tell she's wearing the same uh, outfit. She has that same uh, kinesio tape on the knee. So these were filmed actually within one session. You know, John likes to set three speeds in a set and you do 10 reps of each um, in, in those progressive speeds. So this is the third one of that set for that day for this patient. And we're still doing eccentric loading. You can see the eccentric is half of the concentric resting speed. So now we're getting into, uh, I believe, 35 degrees per second. All right, so now we're in deceleration training. So he's contracting eccentrically 40 degrees per second, and the machine is bringing him back up at 20 degrees per second, or half that. So this is set two. He's 60 degrees per second eccentrically, but 30 degrees per second concentric. And you know it's deceleration training because the contracting speed is twice as fast. This is his third set for the day. 80 degrees per second eccentrically, 40 degrees per second concentrically. Now this is Bradley. I believe the speed we have him exercising is 140 degrees per second here. Now he's actually doing both the concentric and the eccentric. It's a true isokinetic exercise, but we still have those speeds set the same. All right, the next video that I wanna share with you is a, a concept that we call eccentric inhibition. And I want John to join in on this video as well so he can discuss this. Happy so, to, Daniel. Yeah, so what's going on is uh, the patient is contracting eccentrically, but I want you to watch his quadricep and knee. So as he's contracting, he's getting a shutdown or an inhibition from his knee because he hasn't trained eccentrically. So it's almost like the inhibition signal coming from the knee is shutting down that volitional contraction of the quadricep, but his quadricep or his brain is telling that quadricep to go ahead and contract. So it's almost like you're flicking on and off a light switch back and forth. Yeah, we often call this force oscillation in the clinic because what we're actually looking at, especially when you see it on the screen, is almost an oscillation just like you would on an oscilloscope where it moves up and down because it's the muscle is being turned on and off so quickly. And this is not an adverse reaction. This is just telling you that this patient you know, at the speed and the uh, torque amount that they're loading, that that muscle still is adapting to this. And you wanna, so, you wanna see right. this in the clinic occurring here under a safe uh, mode versus going down a stair or doing a single leg jump or a cut. Cause it will happen then if they haven't trained through it on your machine. And so the question is from our standpoint, what should we do when we see this inhibition? Should we increase the speed and make it actually tougher on them? Or should we decrease the speed and give them that ability to go into that neural learning component for a longer period of time? And obviously the answer is reduce the speeds and the amount of resistance that the patient's giving you to make it a smoother contraction. If we actually find that we can't get to that because they've just kind of blown through it, step down one and go to isometrics. Now the last uh, video that I wanna share with you today is the feedback that you're gonna get on the screen to your patient because John mentioned it's about teaching them the exercise correctly. So you have to know what you're looking at before you can teach them. So from the main screen, the first thing we're gonna do is click on the dashboard. This is how we get into our eccentric training as well. From there, we go down to the feedback box and we uncheck the manual settings box. This is gonna bring up all the save protocols that we have for this pattern. Now, the protocol I'm selecting is deceleration at 40, 60, and 80 degrees per second, uh, contracting speed and 20, 30, 40 degrees per second resting concentric speed. 
Now I have it set to alternate a set of quadriceps with a set of hamstrings. Um, this way we cut down on our total rest time and we can maximize the amount of time spent on the machine in the clinic. So this is just one of the proto uh, protocols that we've developed at Proactive. Next, you just have to set your anatomic zero and range of motion. So we see our same athlete that we saw earlier. Um, he's exercising his quad here. He relaxes as the machine lifts him up and then he contracts as it lowers him down. Now, since the exercising speed is faster than the resting uh, concentric, we know that he's doing the deceleration training. I also want you to look at his quad and his knee. As you can see, he's got just a little bit of that eccentric inhibition occurring. A little bit is okay. If you can feel the entire room shaking because they're having so much, you need to back those speeds down for them. Now, let's pause the screens. We gotta, we gotta teach you what the feedback is showing you. So the extensor box or the quads are on the left and the flexor or hamstring is on the right. These are the torque lines for the hamstrings, but for this set, we're working the quad. So we can ignore these for right now. So back over to the quad side. The y-axis is looking at the torque and the x-axis is looking at the joint range of motion. These colors across the top of the screen, that indicates to you what rep lines are which, uh, are which color. Now here are the torque lines for the quad. A few things to note is that each line is right on top of the other. That tells us that he's consistent with his reps and he's got a low coefficient of variance. Another thing to note is the shape of the curve. Since we're exercising eccentrically, the line is curving downward from the zero torque line, but it's still getting that ascending, descending curve that John was talking about earlier. And if we follow that peak torque over to the y-axis, you can see that he's giving us just a little bit over uh, 100 foot-pounds of torque. Now, this can also be found in the top left of your screen where it gives you the peak torque and total work performed in the whole set. You can see that the quad is the top and the hamstring is the bottom, and the left box is peak torque for concentric and eccentric, and the right box is the work for concentric and eccentric. And it tells us that his max torque for the eccentric quad at this set is 110 foot-pounds. Next to that, we have uh, reps and sets right in the middle, and we have time on the far right of the screen. That tells us how much time has lapsed. Above that, we have the real-time dynamometer status, and below that is the range of motion bar. So you can use this bar to cue your patient when the rep begins and ends so they can contract the entire rep. Across the bottom of the screen is where you can adjust the range of motion, speeds, and you can pause the motion, but you're not gonna use these for this type of training. Next to that, we have the feedback session, and you can change to show single or multiple torque lines, torque bars, or work bars. Next to that, we have the cancel button if you need to stop the exercise, and at the very top of the screen, we have the help button. Now let's just watch him complete the set for his quad. I want you to watch each torque line as he exercises. So there's red. The next one, if you look at that color scheme, is going to be green. And the one after that is blue. Now, again, he's very consistent, so it's hard to see. But if you have a patient that doesn't have good control, the torque lines are uh, they're not going to be on top of each other. So that's another good way that you can tell that they're ready. Now, we finished this quad set. So he's only going to get about 15 second rest. And I'm going to have him go right into his hamstring. Now, I'm holding down the chair because our patient here is strong. And so the chair is actually going to lift up. And you can even see that at this time, we needed a new thigh strap. Um, now, we even reinforced the strap at the bottom because he's so strong that he would pull through it. Now, normally, I would stand in front of the patient with one hand on the chair and the other on top of the thigh strap and thigh. But I'm standing off to the side just so you can see for the video. But normally, we wouldn't have that issue. But I wanted you to see uh, the athlete here. Now, if you can look at the screen, you can see the torque lines are going to be on the right side here, and we're going to zoom in on that next. And again, look at the right side. He's contracting. It's going from the right to the left of the screen here. And if we look at his peak torque, we can see that uh, his peak torque for this set was 81 foot-pounds. So if we look at you know, 81 foot-pounds here and he was hitting 110 foot-pounds uh, for his quadricep, he's right in that um, you know, 60 to 80% ratio that we would expect for a quad to hamstring. And that's all the videos that we're gonna have time to get to today. If any of you want to have 
uh, videos for elbow, wrist, and ankle, we have those available. Just go ahead and email Rob, that way we can get those to you. But please don't hesitate to uh, ask questions about anything you saw today or if there's any clarification that you want. Uh, lastly, the, what I wanna tell you about is, you know, you wanna make matches as we do this. So over here on the left side, we have John's uh, newly born grandson, JJ, and I think we've made a match with my uh, newborn Ellie on the right. So maybe you can tell us what you think. I think they look like they'd make a good couple there. Uh, John, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, Daniel, your videos are very good because we want people to come back and, and be able to go through those video concepts over and over again. I think that becomes very important for everyone to participate in. And again, thank you for uh, everyone who's participating. We've got a lot of international um, viewers, so we appreciate that you're you're on with us at such strange times uh, throughout throughout the world. So we welcome that. We welcome your questions and uh, look forward to talking to you guys next month. Got a really good one coming up next month on neuromuscular control and uh, the isotonic mode for dynamic uh, dynamic isotonics. And so it's getting put together right now and we'll see you all next month. Thank you. John and Daniel, well done. Thanks for a good night. Thanks, Rob.